we look at Easter and we think, why? What is all this about that Jesus, God's Son, part of the triune Godhead, why would Jesus have to come and die such a cruel death? What, what's it all about? Why does it have to take place? Isn't there another way, a different plan? Why would God choose a, a cross? And why would he allow his son to be beaten? You start thinking about that and you wonder, couldn't there have been a different way? And you go back and look at the Bible and you look at what God has in store for us. And it, it started in the Garden of Gethsemane when, when God created Adam and he gave Adam, Eve. And in that garden, in that perfect environment, in that perfect body, they chose to sin against God. And when they chose to sin against God, there became a rift between God and man, and that rift was sin. And from that point on, God looked into his divine plan to develop a way to reconcile man to God. And in that reconciliation, his divine plan, he said, I'm going to give up myself, my son, so I can have the appeasement of sin, so I can have reconciliation to man. So, at the appointed time, God sent his only begotten son into this world. And we say that through the birth of Mary. And in that birth of Mary... Jesus being a little baby, and we love celebrating Christmas. It's awesome to get the Christmas presents and talk about the baby Jesus and talk about everything that he has accomplished for us at Christmas. But we fast forward that to Easter. is not near as a pretty picture that Jesus lived that 33 years. And on that event, when he was put upon that cruel cross, it was for a particular purpose. And that particular purpose that we celebrate our Good Friday and Easter on is that Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood, a perfect lamb of God that knew no sin, became sin for you and I so we could have reconciliation back to God. It started in the Eve, in the Eden, and it ended on Golgotha. What was that all about? Jesus was willing to submit his life to the will of the Father and to be put on that cross. Now, it wasn't just somebody being crucified. It was a cruel crucifixion physically. But I want you to think mentally. I want you to think spiritually. He didn't just be put on the cross. He didn't just get scourged. God laid upon the Lamb of God the sins of of the world. Just take your sins. Just take your sins. Imagine every sin that you've ever committed, every addiction that you've ever had, every fear that you've ever went through, that all of your sin, all of your addictions, all of the byproduct of your sin was laid upon Jesus' back, and he bore our sins. Now, times that by the people in this room. Times that by the people in Wichita. And Jesus, the light became darkness because Jesus became sin. God turned his back on Jesus for those hours when he bore our sin. So here, the Lamb of God, Jesus, our Savior, that we call Lord Jesus Christ, we call him that for a reason, because he took your sins. He took my sins. So when we celebrate Easter, when we talk about the cross, the cross around our neck means something more. It is not just something that we can look at. It is something that we can adore because on that cross, we became believers. Because of what he did, we have redemption. We have an advocate. We have heaven. He came off of that cross and he was put into the tomb. And on this Sunday morning, we celebrate a resurrected Christ. Jesus is not dead. Jesus was in that tomb. He conquered that tomb. And three days later, he arose and was victorious and was witnessed by men for 40 days and ascended into heaven. But today, 
we want to look at three different characters that encountered the cross. Three different, in, three different encounters that the cross made an impact. The first encounter was with a man that was crucified with him. Jesus in the center. Dying on the cross for your sins and mine. A man on the right and a man on the left. A man that deserved to die because of his sin. A man on the left deserved to die because of his sin. But Jesus didn't look at the sin of these men. He looked at their heart. And when Jesus looked deep into the heart of an individual, and because of their testimony, the result of these men dying were totally different because Jesus looked past the sin and looked at the heart, the confession of the individual. What would it have been like if you would have been a thief on the cross? What would it have looked like? What would you feel like when you came off that cross and you had been forgiven? Let us watch and listen to the thief on the cross. I didn't have much time left. Breathing was getting harder and harder. I was just hoping for death. Anyone who knew me wouldn't be surprised to see me in this way on a Roman cross. All my life I'd been stealing, cheating and lying. While the other boys were in the synagogue, I was becoming an accomplished thief. I never thought I would be caught. I was so wrong. When the Romans caught up to me, they condemned me to die. My punishment was to be hung on this cross. They hung a sign above my head that said, Elira, thief! There were two others hanging on the crosses with me that day. Mathen, he was a thief like me. And there was a man between us. I didn't know who he was. But the people were calling him Jesus. Some said he was the Messiah. Others called him a blasphemer, a magician. Whatever the case, the priest hated him. But what was his crime? The centurion had posted a sign above his head that said, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the kings. And I thought, it must be a crime to be a king these days. You see, at a crucifixion, there's no words of comfort. It's all about mocking and insults. At some point, I realized I was going to die. Nobody comes down from a cross alive. I didn't know What was going to happen to me when I died? As I thought about my eternity, the physical pain, it became secondary. My soul was in anguish, and my mind was tormented with the thoughts of hell. Then I thought, what if this Jesus was a prophet? Maybe he could work a miracle and bring us all down. But when I looked at him... He was in no condition to save anybody. I had been beaten. But there was nothing. He took a beating, nothing like I did. He was beaten beyond recognition. And the soldiers and priests were shouting, Save yourself, Jesus! I joined in the shouting, If you are the Son of God, bring yourself down. Save yourself. Mathen, he started joining in with the insults and mocking, but I stopped. Where was Jesus' anger? Why wasn't he cursing those that were cursing him? As Mathen continued to hurl insults, insults, I rebuked him. Don't you even fear God? We 
are being punished justly. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. Then came the darkness. Midday, it was like midnight. This man, Jesus, he must have been more than a man. He must have been the Messiah. I turned with all my strength and said, Lord, be with, be with me. Remember me when you, when, I, when you come into your kingdom. And he just turned and looked at me with love in his eyes. And he said, today you will be in paradise. Some people die with loved ones by their side trying to soothe pain, but no one's ever died with Jesus by their side. He sa said words of comfort to me, and he completely eased all of my fears. And as I closed my eyes, and when I opened them, oh, paradise is so much more than you could ever imagine. As you look on the left and you look on the right, you can see yourself either accepting or denying, opening your heart to or saying, it's not for me. But the Bible says it's appointed a man who wants to die and after that the judgment. So we will all evaluate our spiritual condition. Just like the thief on the cross, he didn't really worry about his physical life because he knew his physical life was going to be over. He was going to die. But he cared more about what took place with him spiritually. And every one of us, sooner or later in our life, will have to evaluate, what does it look like when our spiritual life is in jeopardy? Do I have that relationship? Do I have an opportunity to see Christ? Will I enter heaven? And the Bible says in John, let me read this scripture to you. In John, it says this. He will rise, and when everyone rises at that last day... Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. You will have a life if you believe in Christ. The two thieves had a choice. One accepted, one did not. One entered heaven, one did not. It's all about the condition of the soul. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. The other encounter that we're going to witness today is, is really sad. And many of you ladies, when you had a son, you cuddled that son and you loved that son and you took care of that son. And I want to play to your emotions for the next few minutes because I would like to see you taking your son just like Martha took her son, being warned of an angel said, I've got a plan for you. I'm going to give you a son. And your son is going to be the savior of the world. Could you imagine being Jesus' brother? I mean, wouldn't that be crazy? He's perfect. He never gets in trouble. You're the one who gets blamed for everything. I mean, it'd be terrible. But Jesus, the perfect child. Mary said, if that's your will, let it be so. So here, Mary took this little baby out of her womb and nurtured Jesus, trained Jesus. And then you see, until Jesus was about 30 years old, and then Jesus says, I, I have to be doing my father's work. And then the last three years of Jesus' life, he started teaching and preaching and started doing the miracles that he performed until about the last week. And the last week of his life, everything changed. Mary was still following him, was still witnessing him, was still ministering and watching. Mary watched Jesus go down Golgotha's road, the Via Della Rosa, the place of the skull. Mary watched him get beaten. That's my son. We all understand the love that we have for our son. But Mary remembered 
But the angel told her before Jesus was even conceived that you're going to bear a son and your son is going to be the savior of the world. Your son is going to take the sin of the world upon his back. I'm sure that she thought, well, okay, I'm honored that you allowed me to do that and I'm, I'm privileged But there's no way that she would understand the agony, the emotional pain that she's about ready to go through because of the love, because of the passion. That's my boy, but that's my Lord. And I submitted 33 years ago to fulfill God's will within my life. And I will not abandon Jesus. Not in his birth and not in his death. Could you imagine what Mary was going through? Let's watch and see. If I could have, I would have been anywhere but at the foot of his cross that day. Every time I dare glanced up at his body, so distorted, the jeering remarks from the crowds, the hatred from them, my heart broke. They even laughed at him. They laughed at his suffering and his pain. It was just like Simon had said. He prophesied. It was like a sword piercing through my soul. I wanted to run. I wanted to take him down from there and take away the pain and the humiliation. I I was his mother, yet his face, his face was so beaten, I could hardly recognize him. My own son, I could not recognize him. All he had ever done was good. He'd he'd fed the multitudes and and healed the sick and the lame. He even raised from the dead. Yet they crucified him like a common criminal. They put nails in his hands and his feet. Sometimes I can still hear the pounding of the hammer. And I could see the soldiers gambling over his coat. And I could hear the mocking crowd. And where were his disciples when he needed them the most? They'd all fled. All but John, dear, faithful John. It's no wonder my blessed son had asked him to look after me. My husband Joseph, he was dead, and and I had other children, of course, but Jesus was my firstborn. He felt it was his responsibility to take care of me. After all, he was God's son come in the flesh. And in the midst of all of his anguish, he cared enough about me to make sure that I was taken care of. That was Jesus, always thinking of others and never himself. Oh, and Judas, Judas, I wanted to hate him so much for what he'd done to my son, but I couldn't. I couldn't. I didn't understand what was going on at this moment, but I knew, I knew my my God had a plan and that all things were going to work together for his perfect will. The Lord, the Lord had chosen me, me to give birth to his son, little Emmanuel, God with us. I had been blessed above all women, yet I knew, I knew that his coming was for me as much as for anyone else who would call upon his name. I needed him to save my soul as much as the most wicked person, wicked sinner in the world. I put him on this cross. He's hanging there for my sins, my sins and yours. Oh, how I loved him. 
puts a little baby in that stable in Bethlehem. How I loved him for living a sinful life for others to see. Oh, how I loved him for the miracles he performed and had compassion and forgiveness that he had for people. How I loved him for bringing victory over the grave, not just for himself, but for anyone who would believe in him. Oh, how I love him for being my savior. Whether it's the mother or whether it's a thief, we all come to the cross. And I loved what she said. She had to go to Jesus for her salvation. Just like the most rotten sinner, such as the mother of Mary, had to come to Jesus for her salvation. Oh, the encounters at the cross. But there's another encounter that was a very sad encounter. An absent encounter. I can remember growing up in a little town in Kansas where there was farm animals around and you would hear the roosters crow. And you could hear that crow early in the mornings. And Jesus even used this illustration to his disciple Peter. Peter stood up the night before his crucifixion and said, I will never deny you. I will be beside you. I will go to death beside you. I will go to prison beside you. Remember Jesus knowing the heart. He looked at him and said, Peter, you don't get it. The arrogance that you have, that personality that you can control, Satan is going to sift you and you are going to fall to that temptation and you're going to deny me before the morning. And he said, no way. Never happen. It won't happen. And then the denial. Then the depression. Then the sadness. Can you hear it? In your own life? Can you hear it the times where Christ called you? He asked you. And in the quietness of yourself, you could say, yes, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. But in the midst of adversity, in the midst of chaos, somebody confronts you. Eh, not me. I don't want to do that. You take a back step. And the backward trend of our standing up for Christ, sooner or later we have just put it off, delayed it said, no, we have failed. What is Jesus going to do with me? I used to follow him. I loved him, but I failed him. The greatest picture of a real life testimony is not the thief on the cross, because that doesn't fit most of us. And it doesn't fit the mother of Jesus, because that won't fit all of us. But the story of a disciple by the name of Peter fits you, and it fits me every day. What would Jesus do with this man? What would Peter do after denying this man? Let's listen as Peter comes and talks to us. Get out of my head! Get, please, leave me alone! Get, get out of my head! Can't you hear that? Can he, tell me you can hear that, that. That rooster in my head! What can I say? You mentioned the name of Peter, and everybody knows I denied him. I, 
I was so strong and I was so confident. I mean, I told Jesus that I would die for you, Jesus, or I would even go to prison for you. But Jesus knew me better than I knew myself. He knew my spirit was willing, but my, my flesh was so weak. So weak. I mean, when it came to a fight, I would wield my sword against any enemy. I mean, remember in the garden? I cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. But Jesus told me to stop fighting. Then he, he reached out and he touched what was left of that man's ear. And he was healed. I had witnessed another miracle proving that Jesus was who he said he was. And then Judas and the soldiers came rushing to grab Jesus. And I ran away, afraid. I, I left and I went into the shadows. I, I followed them into town. They took Jesus to the, to the palace of the high priest Caiaphas. There was, there was already a large crowd there. But I was so afraid that someone was going to recognize me. So I got close enough where I could hear what was going on. Jesus just stood there with his head bowed and I listened to these false accusations against my master. I mean, this man was my friend. He's the Messiah. He's the one that I have followed for three years. The man I was convinced was the son of God. And he stood before his enemies as meek as a lamb. I, I tried to get closer, but I was afraid that someone would see me. And then my heart, my heart froze. Someone said, you know Jesus, don't you? I said, no, no, I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't know the man. I, you have the wrong person. And then another says, no, you're one of his disciples. I saw you with him. I don't know him! Leave me alone! And I scampered back to the shadows. Finally, I found a place where I thought no one would see me. I saw Jesus again. It was so much, so much noise and confusion, and he just stood there. I asked the man next to me, can you, can you see what's happening? Can you? Can you see what's going on? And he looked at me and said, You're Galilean too, aren't you? I do not know this man. You have the wrong person. I don't know him. And as soon as those words left my mouth, Jesus looked up at me. And that rooster crowed. My mind immediately went back to supper the night before. And it turned out to be our last supper. Jesus told us that he was going to die. That he was going to be the sacrifice for the whole world. And I said, Jesus, I would never let that happen. That will not happen as long as I'm alive. And he reached out and he put his hand on my shoulder he said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. Jesus, there is no way. If everyone falls away because of you, I will remain. And it was just as Jesus said. Satan had sifted me. Just like a farmer sifts his wheat. I, sh I should have been there till the end. I, w I wasn't even at the foot of his cross when he needed me the most. I mean, I'm Peter. I'm the rock. And all I could do was run away and weep. I, I, w I wept for my sin. I wept for denying my Lord and Savior. It... Don't look at me like that. Are you trying to tell me you've never denied him? I'm sorry that 
That wasn't fair. I'm sorry. What can I say? You mentioned the word Peter. And everybody knows I denied him. That is a character that we all can identify with. Let me give you an application. Peter sitting in a crowded courtyard. His third denial. The Bible says that when he denied him for the third time, Jesus turned and stared. He stared right in his eyes. As if he already knew what was going to take place. Peter, seeing that, seeing he denied Christ, he took off and run. Upset, busted, knew that his Savior was just going to be crucified and it was going to be horrific. And then Jesus goes off quietly, goes into prison, goes to the cross. And he does his redemptive work. He dies on the cross. He dies for you and me. Sheds his blood. His body is broken. He's buried. And the third day, he arose. Peter is off crying in the upper room because his best friend was just killed. He thought... He's going to live with that for the rest of his life. But the third day, Mary comes running to the tomb. Jesus was arisen. The stone was rolled away. And here's what Jesus told Mary. Go tell the disciples and Peter that I'm alive. Go tell the disciples and the man that denied me that I'm alive. And I want to see them. Mary books back to the upper room, tells them what was just told. Peter's countenance was uplifted. Can I have a second chance? Could Jesus really be alive? So they came and they met and they served each other. And 50 days, 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the man that denied him three times publicly, that was afraid, that ran away, proclaimed the message, and thousands of people gave their life to Christ. What a wonderful idea of understanding. We all can have that same Fear. We could all know that we have betrayed, we have denied, but Jesus will always forgive. And in that forgiveness, he will empower us never to be the same. He can give us hope for the hurting. He can rescue the discouraged. When we feel like we've done too much, we've gone too far, we feel like there's no hope in us, and Jesus would throw us to the side, he said, tell the disciples and Peter that I love him. I want to forgive him. I want to empower him. I want him to know that it's okay. Satan meant it for bad. Satan wanted to trip him up. Satan wanted to sift him. And I understand that. I understand. But in his sin, I love him. And I want to restore him. And I want to give him hope. That's the application to the disciple Peter. And each and every one of us can identify with that. Each and every one of us can say in our life, I've done too much. I sinned too much. Jesus would look at me and say, you're a dirty, rotten sinner. You didn't stand up for me when I asked you to. You didn't proclaim the message when I prompted you to. You turned your back to me. And then in our spirit, in our fear, we would bow our heads and go off our little way 
and say, you're right. I'm worthless. I'm scum. Jesus would not forgive me. But Jesus says, this is what it's all about. That is what the entire redemptive plan of me being in heaven at the beginning of creation, coming to this sin-filled world, dying a cruel death, so I can restore you. So I can forgive you. So you can look at the Father and say, I love you. You can look at Jesus and say, thank you. That's when we look at the cross and we say, I can't glory in anything other than the cross. Because if it wasn't for the point of the cross, we would all be in our sin. We would all die and go to hell. But because of what Jesus did, and we have access to Jesus, we all have the opportunity to go to heaven. That is why Jesus came. Where are you? Where are you at on the spiritual journey? If I could ask a very simple question, are you satisfied where you are on your spiritual journey? Are you struggling in certain areas? Have you even started your journey? Are you like the thief that you just witnessed Jesus? And you're saying, hey, I, I, I want some of this. I need forgiveness. I deserve what I'm going through. But Jesus, he wants to offer you forgiveness. Or maybe you're like the apostle. And you said, I've gone too far. I've done too much. Go tell the disciples and Peter that I'm here and I want to forgive and I want to restore and I want to empower. The best day of your life can be in front of you if this day of your life you give it to Christ. Will you please bow your heads? I'm going to ask Joey to come up on the platform. We're going to sing a song of invitation. Not necessarily to come forward, but you're more than welcome to do so. But an opportunity for you to at least communicate to God in a quiet, still prayer of your need for him. Identifying with the character. Identifying that I have failed you and I need you. If you are broken to the point that you realize for that very first time, just like on the hill of Golgotha and the thief said, I don't care what people think of me. I need Christ and I'm going to proclaim loudly the name of Christ. He is going to listen. He is going to hear and he will respond to you. Whether you need him for your Lord and Savior or whether you need him for your forgiveness, he is here to restore you and to give you the hope of a future and a hope of heaven. Let us please stand to our feet. A time of invitation, a time of singing, a time of reflection, and a time of invitation. If you would like to talk to somebody, please come forward, kneel at the altar. Somebody will minister to you and pray with you, or you could still pray in your seats. But let us sing this song and respond during this invitation.